Um, so I'm kind of gonna, it was a very nice transition going from uh, Teresa's uh, presentation to mine because I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the nutritional aspects of what she discussed. Um, so I'm gonna talk very specifically about the nutrition and it's gonna make it seem like, hey, just put this in the ground. But as Teresa mentioned, you have to think about other things like your soil um, and what you're able to plant in your area. But I'm gonna talk about um, options as far as nutrition and how and the important parts of nutrition when you're grazing animals on pasture. Um, so first I'm gonna go through the important nutrients for livestock when you're grazing on pasture. And the first one I wanna talk about is water because I think this is something that people forget is it's such an important nutrient. Um, it's essential for life, obviously we know this, but it's also essential for digestion. If they're not getting the water that they need, they're not gonna digest and use those nutrients you're giving them as well. So making sure that you have free access to water um, always is really important, but also understanding that different animals are gonna have different water needs. Um, so I found these, these charts that kind of show exactly what that means. And so if you look at for a lamb or for a sheep, uh, if you look at the lambs here, they don't need much, but then all of the other lamb or sheep need about the same amount, except for lactating ewes. Their needs jump up a lot. So if you have ewes that are lactating, you need to make sure that they have enough uh, water to, to satisfy their needs to lactate, but also as maintain their own body. And then if we look at horses too, there's a great deal of difference within their needs with the young ones needing quite a bit less. But again, if we look at the pregnant and lactating animals, they're gonna need quite a bit. When we look at mature animals, um, they're about the same, but what's interesting is when they're in their thermoneutral zone. So when they're in that zone that they're very comfortable, they're not stressed one way or the other due to temperature, they need about an average amount. But once you get below that thermoneutral zone, when you're cold or when you're hot, you're gonna to need to increase their water. They need that to maintain their body. And then that's for an idle horse. But when we move up to moderate horses, um, moderately exercised horses, we see a, a bigger difference. When they're in their thermoneutral zone and they're comfortable, they need about half as much as they need when it's hot out. So it's really important to, to keep that in mind when you're setting up your pastures that um, you have a system that allows them to drink all that they need so that they're getting the nutrients they need. Next, I'm gonna talk about fiber. This is obviously a big part of pastures because they're eating a lot of grasses and legumes. So when we look at this uh, plant cell, um, some important parts that include the fiber are the cell wall that include cellulose and hemicellulose. And what those are is just complex carbohydrates. They're a little harder to break down than the sugars and starches that are inside the cell. But those need to be broken down before we can get to the fat and the protein, which give a lot of good energy to our animals. Um, so when the, when the plant is young, it has a single cell wall um, that's easy to permeate, easy to get through. And as it gets older, it gets the second cell wall and then eventually, as it matures more, uh, more lignin gets deposited. And so this is an indigestible part of the cell, which means it's much more difficult even for ruminants. So ruminants have uh, a benefit because they have their rumen, which is full of bacteria that can break down this fiber really easy. Non-ruminants like us or pigs, they don't have that ability. Um, so it's harder for them to break down grasses, but ruminants, and horses, so horses are hind gut fermenters. They have the ability to break things down uh, later in the, the GI tract compared to the ruminants, um, but they're able to break down a lot of this fibrous material. This lignin isn't digestible by anything. Um, so it limits your access through the cellulose and hemicellulose to these really nice nutrients. Um, so as the plant gets larger, that lignin starts building up. And what I've heard it described as basically, if you build a brick wall without any mortar, um, that's like a young plant. It'll take a little bit of effort to get through those cell walls, but you can kind of push through. Once you put that mortar in, it's very, very difficult to get through. And so that's gonna make it very undigestible for the animal. So when, if you've ever tested your fiber, if you've ever sent out a hay sample or a pasture sample, usually what they'll send back is something called neutral detergent fiber. And that's basically just breaking down the fiber to see um, the structural components of that plant. 
And this is important because it'll tell us how much uh, an an how much an animal can consume, um, which will end up ultimately leading to how much of those nutrients they're going to get. So part of it is the digestible part, um, which is where the rumen can ferment that fiber for energy and microbial protein production. Um, so that's a real a benefit to the animal. The indige indigestible part is what escapes the rumen. So the bacteria in the rumen do not break it down. It leaves the rumen um, and it ends up in the feces. So basically, as a plant matures, the percent of NDF will go up, which means the amount that's getting digested goes down. So here in this, in this chart, you'll see as the grass matures for three different forages, all of them are decreasing. Um, so having a younger plant will give you more digestibility that animals can have more nutrients compared to an older plant. So if you increase NDF, Typically, because it's bulkier, it's fiber, we're always told, you know, to fill our bellies to eat more fibrous vegetables. It's the same for them. If they eat more fibrous, indigestible feeds, their feed intake is going to be lower because it's going to fill up their belly. Um, it's going to take longer to digest and it's going to move through slowly. So then we talk about energy and protein. These ones, um, you know, are pretty obvious, especially when you're heavy, when you have animals that are in high growth stages or um, are lactating, things like that, their needs are going to be a little different than maybe an animal that's maintaining or a horse that isn't being ridden a whole lot. Um, so if we look at this, this is just kind of how energy um, moves. So you have the gross energy of a, a path of a forage. Um, and from that, you're going to lose a little bit of energy to feces, urine, gases, and heat um, because metabolism takes uh, energy and so that's released as heat. So what you're left with is the net energy, and that's what the animal can use for growth, lactation, and maintenance. Um, so when you're looking at what sort of energy is available to your animal, you're really looking at what's left over after, every, uh, after the entire metabolism process. And so these requirements are going to change based on a lot of things. And you'll see this is, this is the same thing throughout all of the, these different nutrients. So water, um, we're going to look at minerals later. It's the same thing. It's impacted by all of these different um, species, breed, gestation, lactation, activities, a big one, and stress. Um, so for instance, um, we grow a lot of calf-fed Holsteins down here. And compared to your typical beef breed, they require 10 to 12% more energy. So when you're looking at the animals you have, you have to make sure that you're looking at um, what their specific needs are for that animal, their age, all of that they're not all gonna be the same. Um, and that's because when um, an animal is gonna develop their bone structure to a point, and then they're gonna be done developing bone. And after that, you're mostly gonna be depositing this muscle and fat. And so that's gonna take that extra energy and protein. But once they hit that mature weight, you're just maintaining the same levels. It's not um, quite as necessary to have such a higher requirement. So as an example here, um, we have, it, this was a really nice chart because they show a ewe who's in maintenance and then gestating and then very late gestation and lactation. And as you can see, um, during maintenance and early gestation, not much of a difference in crude protein, so their protein requirement. But all of a sudden, once you get to late gestation and lactation, their requirements go way up. So when you're looking at your animals, um, their needs may change uh, even within the same animal. So it's important to understand that um, as they change, uh, their needs will also change. So when we look at vitamins and minerals, the same sort of thing happens. It's gonna change based on their age, their species, their breed, all of that, but it's also gonna change based on where you're at. Different geographic areas are gonna have different amounts of minerals in the soil um, available to the animals. Um, so, and this, this doesn't even have to be really big differences in geographic area. You could go a couple miles down the road and they could have a completely different mineral content of their soil. Um, so that's why it's important to test your soil, um, test your forage. But the best way to tell where your animals are at as far as mineral and vitamins is doing blood and serum samples. So working with your veterinarian to take those samples and figure out uh, what they may be deficient in or what they may be excessive in that way, um, if you need to supplement, you know what to supplement because really 
you want to stay in this optimum level. You don't want to get into the marginal or toxic on either side, because that will also impact um, growth and production as well. So talking about plant maturity, again, we've talked about NDF and how that affects um, the fiber in the plant. But for plant maturity, we've done studies down here. We do um, some forage studies and we looked at fine grass and Bermuda grass and we saw exactly what I told you earlier that um, the percent of NDF as the plant matured to late season was higher than early season. But we also saw that as plant matured, crude protein went down quite a bit. So this was almost at 17% and went below 13% crude protein. So that's a pretty big um, fall from early season to late season. But we also lose our concentration of energy because as I said earlier, when it, uh, the plants become indigestible, that energy is not available to the animal. Um, so you lose that energy and you lose the concentration of minerals as well. So you're losing a lot when you, um, as the plant matures. So you can manage for plant maturity, uh, and Teresa hinted or talked about this um, with rotational grazing and being able to even, even the smallest acreage could really uh, make these small paddocks and manage their grasses um, so that the forage is always at the right maturity level, um, but also has that time to regrow and rest, um, like they mentioned. So basically, you have your animal grazing a paddock um, until the appropriate level for that plant. Um, and then you move them, graze that paddock, move them again, graze that paddock, move them until they're back to their original paddock. And what this does is it gives, makes it so there's always a, a, a young, not immature plant that's palatable for the animals. Um, but sometimes the mature forage is good. Teresa mentioned this, um, that horses may not need uh, quite so many nutrients, especially a horse in maintenance um, that's lightly worked. Um, so if you don't, if your animal does not need those high nutrient, nutrient dense feeds, then a more mature plant is not necessarily a bad thing. So looking at some common pasture grasses, um, you can tell here that there's some differences. The grasses are all kind of similar as far as uh, fiber um, and protein, some a little lower than others. But the big differences are with these legumes. You'll see that the, the NDF is very low for these, but high crude protein. Um, the problem is, is they can cause bloat, uh, even the less likely to bloat, um, bloat causing ones can still cause some bloat. So it's important to just keep that in mind when you're choosing. Um, and then climb grass, while it is a very good um, forage for cattle, it can cause liver damage in horses, sheep, and goats and photosensitization in small ruminants. So they can just be really sensitive to the sunlight um, and, and have skin damage easier than a typical animal. And so, like Teresa mentioned, then we could go to seed mixtures. Um, and this is important from a nutrition aspect and having forage all year round. So if you wanna maintain your animals on grass all year round, um, the best option or all season would be um, mixing the, the cool season and warm seasons, uh, warm season grasses so that you always have a forage for them to consume. And then using that rotational grazing plan could really make it so you have enough forage to sustain your animals and also give them the nutrients they need. So when we talk about supplementation, this is important when soil and forages are deficient for specific nutrients. So like I said, minerals are an important one, um, but also forage. If you don't have enough forage, whether it's because it's just a rough year, it didn't grow like it was supposed to, um, you have more animals than you planned, you may have to supplement with hay or other feeds in order to meet their nutrition needs. Um, not enough energy. Um, so if they're eating um, a more mature grass, you may have to supplement with a higher energy feed. Especially, this is especially important for lactating animals and animals that you, you're finishing off. So the cattle, maybe if you're finishing off some um, cattle. Um, and so it, it could be as simple as just throwing in some corn or having an agreement with a local brewer. If you have one nearby, you could go get some of their spent brewer's grains. 
Um, those are really nice protein supplement as well as higher energy than your, than your forages. If you don't have enough minerals, um, again, this is best to always check, work with your veterinarian to take your blood and serum samples, see where they're at, and then feed a free choice mineral specific to those, um, whatever might be lacking in that. Um, and depending on the mineral and deficiency, boluses might be appropriate. Um, but also uh, testing the forage also helps, it can help indicate um, what might be an issue as well. So some things to consider as you look at pasture nutrition and, and what you need for your animals. Um, know your animals. How many do you have now? And then how many, how many in the future? Uh, it's easy to bring home another animal and then realize it uh, might be a little bit too much. Um, and then what biological state are they in? Are they lactating? Are they growing? Or are they just in maintenance? What do they need? And um, how can you maximize the area you have to feed those animals? And then are they deficient in any nutrient? Are they hitting those goals you have? So if you have growing animals, are they growing at the rate that you want them to? Or do you need to add something in order to help maintain? And then know your forage. Know the maturity. Um, Teresa had a really nice uh, maturity chart um, for that. And I thought that was a really nice way to look at where your plants are at. Um, but also know the nutrient makeup, um, which could mean testing. Um, so sending off some of your forage for testing just to see where it's at. And then also knowing your biomass production, because again, that will tell you how many you can support on that land. And then if you need to supplement with anything. Um, some other things to consider, palatability, obviously, if they're not going to eat it, they're not going to get the nutrients um, cost. Some feeds, uh, one thing I wanted to include was this is the cost of corn and fat over the past like two years, it's gone up quite a bit. Um, so when you're looking at supplemental feeds, some things are going to be a little more expensive than others. So maybe finding a way that fits your system the best. Availability, um, Teresa explained that different grasses can be grown in specific areas. Um, so sometimes the most nutritious grasses may not be the best option for growing. So understanding that balance there and then just planning to understand how much uh, feed you have for your animals. Um, so there are a couple resources that I thought were really nice um, from ANR. Uh, that kind of gave an overview of some of this. A lot of the nutrition um, and palatability was included on that. So uh, like Teresa said, they'll have these that we can add onto um, the website. Um, and then I can take any questions.